I am thrilled to be here at the UN. Um, uh, by the way, Dad sends his best. He, uh, he was the administrator of the UNDP, and he had a wonderful career and uh, had a wonderful time at the UN. Uh, he actually took me on one of his missions. Uh, we went to Uganda, and we met with President Marabeni, and I remember him having this discussion about minestrone soup. And I said, uh, I said, well, what was that all about? And he said, well, we're trying to create a free market here in Uganda, and we wanted him to think about uh, that it didn't have to necessarily be Ugandan vegetables that the, the tourists would want to eat. And, uh, and so that's what the story was. Um, but what I'm here to talk about is competition. Competition is good. We are all better off from competition. When businesses have to compete with each other, we get better pricing, we get better service, uh, and the businesses themselves get better. Uh, competition keeps us on our toes. And, and monopolies are bad. Monopolies are where they, don't ha they can price it any way they want, and the service provided can be whatever they want. And so I got to thinking, why are governments all monopolies? So I thought, well, what about competitive governance? Countries should compete for us. We're now pretty mobile. We can go become citizens of any country of the world. Why don't we have countries compete for us? And then I thought, boy, that's interesting, because they kind of have. Um, I had a mission. My life was, is a mission. And the mission has been to spread entrepreneurship and venture capital around the world. And, uh, and that mission has, has had a lot of benefits. We've been able to fund a couple of companies that have uh, made it so that we can, uh, we can communicate with anybody in the world through email or, or uh, video conference. Uh, we've we've had, a, had a hand in uh, a few of the search engines that have allowed us all to share the global human knowledge. And, uh, and so if somebody over here knows how to drill a well, uh, they can send it to somebody over here just by putting it up on, on a search engine. So, uh, so the mission's been very successful. We've, uh, we've been able to fund companies that are now worth tens of billions of dollars on each of three continents. We've funded uh, 60 companies, uh, I mean, sorry, 600 companies around the world, and, uh, and they, they cover about 35 countries. So I've gotten this great view. I've been so lucky. I've gotten this great view of the world. And so what I'm going to do is take you around the world. We're at the UN. Might as well take you around the world. So I went to Ukraine, and I was looking to see if there was an opportunity there. And, um, and the president of Ukraine made it so that I was actually the first person from America to step on Ukraine soil without a visa. And they made it so that visas were free. And he was very proud of himself. Uh, this was President Yashchenko. He, he won the presidency by the Orange Revolution. It turned out they, they used instant messaging to, uh, to keep the pressure on the Capitol so that there were plenty of roses for the girls to put into the guns at the front line. And eventually, the Capitol melted, and the Orange Revolution succeeded. Uh, so I got a chance to meet President Yashchenko, and, and he said, you must invest in our country. And I said, well, I'm not so sure. It takes 23 bureaucrats and, and six months before you can even incorporate in this country. And he said, that will be one bureaucrat, one week. And, and I thought, well, that's really interesting. He wants to compete for us. He wants to compete for entrepreneurs. And uh, so I, I thought, that's, that's great. Now, it hasn't happened, still very bureaucratic in Ukraine, but he had at least in his mind that that was going to happen. Um, I went to Holland. I met Mark Rutte, the prime minister, and we had a great discussion, and, and he, he has some great vision because he was focused on the, on the children of his country. 
He said, I want to create innovators. I like your program, BizWorld. I set up a, a program to teach entrepreneurship to 10-year-olds. Uh, and, uh, and he said, I like your program, and I want that to happen because I know that if we educate these people well and we get them to be innovators, that we will have the best economy of the world in 30 years. So he had this great vision. I met with the deputy prime minister of uh, Vietnam, and we had a wonderful discussion. He said, uh, he said, you must invest in our country. And I said, well, why? And he said, well, lower cost of living than China, better rules than China, and uh, the population is younger than China. And, and then he said, and we're very friendly people. <laughs> and I, I looked at him and he said, but don't try to attack us again. <laughs> so then, um, then I went to Russia and, um, and saw Medvedev speak, and he said, markets are like parachutes. They're only good when they're open. And, uh, and I thought, wow, even Medvedev, even the country that had the Bolsheviks that kind of ruined business for 75 years, even they realize now that they are trying to attract venture capital, entrepreneurs, great minds, and businesses. I went to Singapore and talked to Deputy Prime Minister Tony Tan, and Tony and I had a great discussion, and I said, you know, maybe there should be a stock market that we, we can all invest through globally, and then only when you repatriate to your country do you, uh, do you pay the taxes that that country requires. And, uh, and he, he looked at me, he goes, interesting, and that was at breakfast. At lunch, he had me surrounded by the head of the Singapore stock market and the head of the Singapore SEC. They are aggressively, potentially, the most business-oriented country on the planet. Uh, followed closely by Korea, uh, here I met with President Lee, and his focus was purely on business, but he, the, his successor, President Park, is focused completely on the Silicon Valley. She has decided that they are going to find out everything they possibly can about the Silicon Valley, and they're going to bring that back, and they're going to make Korea a Silicon Valley. And, and so this competitive governance for the great minds in the capital is starting to happen everywhere. Now, um, fun story. Um, I, was in, uh, I was in Palo Alto, and I had agreed to be on a panel. I, I had agreed to speak at a conference in Palo Alto with my friend Tony Perkins. And, uh, and the same day, we had to have our first uh, Skype board meeting in Estonia. And I thought, oh, how can I be in two places at once? Well, now it's kind of obvious. But um, at that time, Skype was a, an audio, uh, audio phone service and reached about 3 million people. And there were about 100,000 simultaneous users. And, uh, and I said, oh, well, maybe we can do video conference, Tony. And he said, he said yeah, that'd be great. You know, he's a risk taker. That'd be great. Why don't you put Nicholas Zenstrom on the, on the thing with you, and the two of you can do a Q&A. And I said, great, that'd be terrific. And so I, I went to Nicholas, and I said, hey, can you guys get video conferencing equipment? And he said, oh, yeah, no problem. And at that time, video conferencing was like this. Um, <laughs> but... But uh, Nicholas seemed very confident, and, uh, and so we get in there, and he, he turns to the door, and he, I said, okay, we're ready to go. And he, said, he turns to the door, and he goes, okay, throw the switch. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, oh, well, we've been working on something in the back room, and, uh, and so we're kind of going to use our own system for this. And I said, what? You're going to use some, some alpha test for our video conference? And he said, oh, yeah, no problem. Um, and it worked perfectly. And I talked to Tony, and everything was so beautiful. Tony said, oh, yeah, it's clear as a bell. And I said, well, Nicholas, how'd you do that? And he said, well, we, we cut off 100,000 simultaneous phone calls so that we could have enough bandwidth so that we could do the video. <laughs> and it seemed to work OK. Um, so entrepreneurs will do anything. They change things. They shake things up. 
Now, China is, uh, is another great story. My dad actually took me to China 30 years ago, but if you f flash forward 15 years, I met with the uh, uh, Minister of Finance, and he said, invest in our country. And I said, uh, why would I invest in your country? And he said, because we have a billion people. And I said, I said but the last guy I talked to was a, uh, had a chocolate company, and he built it up to 90 million in revenue, and you guys nationalized it. And he said, hmm. And uh, actually, there was a translator, so I'm not quite sure what went back and forth there. And then I said, uh, he said, well, what would you suggest? And I said, just make it so that the early investors in China make a lot of money, and then all their friends will come to China and invest. And uh, I don't know whether he was listening, but that's kind of what happened. So what's happened in our country? Land of the free, home of the brave. Hmm. How free are we? We are the most, we have the largest population of, of uh, incarcerated people. Uh, and as a percentage, the largest percentage of incarcerated people in the world. Uh, when, I, when I started my school, I realized that, uh, that I, I had to talk to many commissions, and each commission had little things to say, and I couldn't get approval to build the school until uh, one commission thought that the color was appropriate, and one commission thought that the awning should be you know, a different shape and size. And, uh, and then we had uh, the fire and safety guys saying that you had to have two points of egress. And I thought, well, okay, that's fine. I'll put in another point of egress. And then the historical society said, no, you can't have two points of egress because <laughs> it's a historic building, apparently. And, uh, and so I thought, well, you know, how free really are we when when the decisions about orphans, the decisions about what a doctor does with his patient, the decisions about education in our local schools are all made by an impersonal bureaucracy. And how brave are we when uh, we're, we're in a position where, uh, where we watch TV for six hours a day and we... Uh, and, and we, we're, not, we're not allowed to invest in private companies with our own money unless we're millionaires. Something's wrong. So there's some great entrepreneurs here that have done some great things to try to counteract that, uh, that lack of freedom and bravery. Uh, Bitcoin is one. It's taking on the currencies of the world. And, and, uh, and sea land is another. It's... It's a country that started just on that platform down there. And, uh, and Blue Seed is this vision of an entrepreneur who has, is going to put a big boat out there 11 miles from Silicon Valley. And, and so he's going to bring in all those engineers and allow them on tourist visas to come to work and then go back and live on, on, uh, on his boat. Uh, and then, of course, uh, technology is, is winning all wars. It's overthrowing bad governments, and it's encouraging good governance. Uh, so it's great that we have technology. So I leave you with one thought. The countries of the world need to compete for you. Go out there and force your country, force your people to compete for you. And then once again, not only this land, but the entire earth will be the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you.